and welcome to the BK Show podcast. This is episode number 36, and today I am once again joined by my friend, John Warren. John was on the podcast previously, that is episode number six, where we went in-depth of previous businesses that we ran in the high-ticket dropshipping realm. Uh, John exited one of his businesses, I've exited a few of my businesses, and we just kind of deep dove into what those businesses were, which a lot of people in this industry aren't very public with what their niche is or what market they're in, and so we wanted to be wide open, uh, deep dove into John's history and, and how we you know kind of came up together in the world of high-ticket dropshipping and where that's led us to, uh, and now John is uh, about to release a new course, and so I wanted to have John on here, this is something him and I have been discussing for a while, that one of us needs to do this, I'm glad John is doing it. And today he wanted to talk about it and I actually kind of pushed him into, let's just give it all away for free. So, uh, if you're wondering what high ticket dropshipping is or, or you wanted a little more detail, this is it. Cause we literally give the whole playbook away for free in this episode, which is fantastic. I'm gonna, not going to bore you with any more intro. I'm just going to dive right in. Cause this show is awesome. Enjoy this show with myself and John Warren, John Warren. Welcome back to the show, buddy. Hey man. Awesome to be here again. You uh you hold the record of third most listened to episode uh for episode number six. So if you uh are wondering who John Warren is, we went through his story in epi- episode number six, and we were talking uh, right before the call. Uh, I told you the amount of downloads there, uh, and you were like, "That's all." <laughs> and so we were discussing. <laughs> I think some of the old shows were incredible, incredible, and I'm like, man, how do I get more? ears on some of these old shows that were just absolutely fire yours is one of them uh taylor holiday who's coming back on the show i believe i believe that will go out the week after this one goes out his yeah, was cool. episode number seven right after yours uh, weird that we're going back to back again his was incredible stories as well um my favorite episode might be episode number one with with cave he told a, an incredible yeah. story um the he had some issues with an old business partner, and since that episode, it's kind of came public, and so uh, maybe I should have him back on. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, to, yeah, right. I know that story. <laughs> publicly shit all over that guy, because he deserves it. Um, yeah. But yeah, your, your episode is one that I, I listened to it again. I, I went for a walk this morning, listened to the whole episode, and I was you know kind of making sure that we don't repeat things if we don't have to um yeah, but i course. forgot how good it was man we we both had a crazy journey you and i have come up together this like we've been on this journey literally about the same amount of time and had a lot of fun together yeah it's about seven years now i guess isn't it and um or there, thereabouts and uh yeah i think when you do like you know a, a show of any nature obviously i think your first episodes are always with people that you know yeah like you know quite well you're friends with whatever it might be um, so I think sometimes that's why on podcasts, you know, those first episodes are always awesome because you're like, you're chatting to people that you already chat to, you know what I mean? And so it's really, it's much more natural. You feel more comfortable. You're not nervous. Um, and I think going to really cool, cool areas. So yeah, I, I think getting people back on the show, talking about your old stuff, that's a good way to give those old episodes a bit more life for sure. You just said you weren't awkward. Uh, I will. I will say if you go back and listen to episode number six, <laughs> it feels a little awkward for about ten minutes. I'll say that. But uh, you and I really settled in. We, we we talk about some of your old businesses, uh, like uh, Chic Chandeliers is your old business that you sold. <laughs> yeah. We talk about my yeah, first yeah. business, the three D Printer Guy dot com, which is not online anymore, but you can see it on Wayback Machine. We talk about uh, a bunch of stuff in our journey that I thought was really really cool. And so if you're into if you're into e-commerce or, or high ticket drop shipping specifically, you know, that's a, that's a great episode. Yeah, totally. Totally. I think uh, between the two of us, we've, um, yeah, we've done a lot in that space and uh, a lot of different things and had some fun, some good stories and all that sort of thing. And, you know, I think both for both of us, you know, that, that journey and all of that's been pretty, pretty life changing to put it lightly. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, thinking about have- where, where we both started before that and uh, you know, that was Where one of the notes now. I asked. Yeah, that's one of the notes I asked you to uh, take for the show of like, where has this journey taken us through through high ticket dropshipping? And, and literally, the only note I had um, is freedom. Like, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade yeah. this for the world. Uh, do I, I do want to riff? We were starting to riff before, and I said, let's hit record because I, I want to hear. So, like, I want to get, <laughs> I want to get ears on the old podcast. So I've said this on a few other podcasts. When you start anything, whether it's your business or or a podcast or whatever it is, so specifically with podcasts, no one listens, right? Like it's really hard yeah. to, to get started. This is why I think eight is the average number of podcasts people do. And then they quit. Um, yeah. and so, right. uh, I wasn't going to quit. I committed to doing 52 episodes 
and I knocked him out. But back then, it, you know, when I first started, I, I had a little bit of an audience left from Ecom Fire, and you know, I had you on because I could reach out. We had a, a very similar following, but yeah. you know, uh, my you know probably my wife's grandma listened and uh, my friend Bill <laughs> and like uh, you know I've made this joke before, but like it's not it, it doesn't start out great and and the numbers don't look good and you have to celebrate uh, four five six. 10, 20 people listening to it and, and be excited about it, right? And uh, I think uh, Angie Lee always says, ready is a lie, <laughs> that, that no one's going to show up and, and you just need to, to go. Um, but now looking back, like, some of those are really taken off, right? Like yours, I said, is the third most listened to episode. Um, and I thought it was good. And and, and, and again, my friend Kayvon and, and Taylor and uh, Brian Angel was on in episode number two that really took off. I'd love to get more listens back to those. And I, I'm not really sure what to do. Like, should I you know run Facebook ads? How do I get listeners you know you know i love talking about the listener as we are talking to the listener but how do i get the listener to share some of these episodes that really you know were passionate or or really hit a spot for them that that made them excited yeah i uh, look it's a tough one like i mean sure that i think there's a lot of ways that you know you could actively promote those sort of things i mean you know, talking about running Facebook ads i, I don't know that that's necessarily the way i mean you think about it it's, it's going to cost you money like you know this is at this point i mean this is not a podcast that's directly monetized or anything right so you're doing it because you love doing it i mean i I think i'd be right in saying that and you want to bring value to them in whatever way you can by sharing stories with some of the great people you know and and all of that sort of all of that sort of thing which is fantastic um and uh, as as we were talking about before i think that's why some of your listeners really love what you do is because it's not like a you know, buy this, you know, do that sort of sort of show, you know what I mean? Where you're trying to like hardcore monetize it and get all, you know, turn it into basically a funnel for some sort of business opportunity or something. Yeah, I would love to start it like Joe Rogan and be like, this episode is brought to you by the motherfucking Cash App. And just, you know, (laughs) just to say motherfucking Cash App. Um, Yeah, I I haven't monetized it. it, And, uh, you know, put a few bucks into this. the PNL doesn't look great for for last year of as far as like getting some of the equipment and sure. and some of the other things it, it, and and I've affiliated a few things uh, I think this show um well I haven't recorded the intro yet will probably be brought to you by uh Bonjoro uh which I know both of us love and so uh I I've put a few things out there but you're right I I haven't monetized it I don't know if I want to go run a bunch of Facebook ads but you know getting in any business getting people on your email list isn't easy uh getting people to to share things isn't uh i easy either i know you told me before the call hey you know go get on some other podcast to get uh the word out there but uh just wondering how to get those old episodes the love they deserve you know yeah look I, yeah I, look there's probably ways that you can do it and look i'm by no means a, a podcasting expert or anything like that specific i'm sure there's people out there that have much better ideas around this than i do but a couple of things that have worked for me in the past so you you know you know i have sort of an on and off video show that i do video lives in my facebook groups and things like that um and i've often used those to you know get people onto my email lists um and so what i do there is i'll offer like some bonus piece of content that people and i'll put that in the video like if you like this topic i've got this thing you can go and download go and here's the Obviously, here's the URL, jump on there, they put their email address in, they get access to something extra. Um, So they don't pay for anything, it's all free. Um, And uh, it's just usually something that relates to that particular episode. And it's often something that I was doing anyway, right? That I was going to putting together anyway, maybe for my team about building sites or something like that. And I just give it to the listeners for free. Um, And that's that actually works pretty well for me in terms of getting people, you know, onto onto an email list. you know, obviously where I can start communicating to them about all the other things um, that I'm working on. Uh, So, I mean, that's one thing. The other way you can probably get a bit of love back to old episodes sometimes is, um, and I don't know, this might not work for everybody, but I certainly wouldn't have a problem with it is, is, you know, talking to your people who have been on those past episodes and seeing if they can keep promoting it to their audience. Do you know what I mean? Um, because a lot of the people that you have on, I mean, some of them aren't necessarily going to have a massive email list or, you know, big social channels, but some of them are. Um, and with, with anything, when you promote something via email or on social media or anything like that, only a proportion of people see it each time, right? You know, only 30% of people open that email or, you know, if they're chucking it on a Facebook page, less than 10% of people might see it or whatever. So I think having a sort of, 
regular, you know, promotion schedule that doesn't need to be paid necessarily. You know, I mean that that might help as well. You know, so yeah, like, even just re-promoting old episodes right and tagging them and reminding them you know what i mean like uh there's certainly a bunch of promotion that i haven't done here uh yeah i, I do like to build in public though so hopefully people you know as we talk about some of these ideas they enjoy this conversation is um yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd rather just share what i'm doing i think there's a lot of people listening who maybe want to start a podcast or maybe want to start their business and uh if i can provide some advice on here's what here's how i'm thinking through what i'm trying to do um hopefully give some advice also like you know and and that i'm not doing everything i should be doing hopefully (laughs) other people listening are like oh thank god you know other people aren't doing it all the things either you know yeah yeah pieces of content you i mean if i have a content plan for content i'm producing whether it's blog content or something else um on a website i would promote that like four times a year the same piece of content to the same audience i mean because reach is what it is on any platform and you never reach everybody so you know, you, you can you can recycle stuff. And I think that's perfectly a legitimate thing to do. Um, mostly because everybody's attention span is so short that most people forget what they listened or watched two, three months later anyway. Yeah, it's a <laughs> it's a barrier. The promotion thing's a barrier, but no one's going to promote you but you. Like you, you have to be your best promoter. And um, yeah, it's weird. I, I think I talked about this with uh, Chase Diamond back on his episode. Uh, I can't log into Twitter without seeing that guy talk about email marketing. Um giving value yeah. but every day it's something 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 like 10 times a day uh and then you know hey check out my course check out my course you know what i mean and like uh i was giving him giving him shit that i saw him every time on twitter but you have to be your own promoter right like you have to be out there constantly and um to your point of like offering something you know i'm a big fan of amy porterfield uh, uh used to listen to her show a ton and and she yeah. teaches something on every episode so i think it's a little easier to offer something when you teach something right it is That's she true. advises yeah. that here, you know, I'm going to teach this. You can go get your starter kit by going to, you know, amyporterfield.com slash yeah. whatever episode number it is. Uh, it's a little different when I'm just, just bullshitting. Yeah, it is. But at the same time, I mean, it's one of those things where you have ultimate creativity. I mean, you, you can do so much, you could do so many different things. I mean, I'm not going to suggest I have the answer to that for you right now, but I mean, that's one of the great things about, I think, you know, doing something where you're creating is that, like, you know, you like creating content in any sense. There's so many different ways you can come at it. So many different things you can do, right? And, and maybe, maybe it's not such an obvious thing as yeah, I'm teaching this. Go and download this, which will show you how to do it more. Um, but look, I, I'm sure if if you sat down and gave it some thought, even even with your <laughs> with your bullshitting shows, as you uh, as you put it, like there's going to be something that you could offer your audience. I have no doubt that they would find valuable, even if it doesn't directly relate to that particular episode, right? It's still something that you could put in the, in the open or the close of the show and, you know, drive a few people in that direction and, you know, at, you know to something that's actually good and will provide them some value uh, in whatever it is they're seeking to do. Because, I mean, you know, even if it's just something based on your experience, I mean, what people, people listen to these shows a lot of the time for insight into how they can do things, you know, unique insight that you and your, your guests have and you know just in in the things that you've done and with you know over the last seven years i mean most of your audience is going to be probably in a similar place to where you've been or where you are and so even something where you're just giving them a bit more depth and insight into things that you've done or things that you've learned uh just in a more general sense can be valuable well speaking of of offers uh we specifically had you back on today because you have a new offer. Um, and I want to talk about it. I want to talk about really our journey in, in, in what you're, what you're planning to teach here. So like, um, first off, let's get the, let's get the sales pitch out of the way. What, what, are you, what is the new offer from John <laughs> Warren? Uh, so the new offer from John Warren is a high ticket drop shipping program, um, uh, which is basically an online education and group coaching program. Uh, that will take people through a system to build, launch, and grow a high-ticket dropshipping e-commerce business from scratch, um, from starting with no experience right through to having a business that you can launch and you know make sales and profit on and grow um, to the sort of levels that you and I have worked on businesses, multi-million dollar a year businesses uh, over time. Obviously, it's, this is by no means a, a get-rich-quick uh, offer. It's a, it's a hard work and if you put in the work, you'll get there. Um, but yeah, it's it's walking people through the complete process to set that up, 
step by step. Uh, and it's not just about building a business as well. It's, you know, if you're somebody who already has a high ticket dropshipping business that you're sort of maybe struggling to grow or you're not quite getting to where you want to be with it, um, it's pretty much the most or the only thing on the market that I'm aware of anyway that deals with the complete marketing system you need for a high ticket dropshipping business to grow it successfully. So it's for people who are looking to get started who, you know, just want to get into the e-commerce space or want to try a different model. But it's also for people who are already there, but not, you know, not quite where they want to be yet. And they, they feel like, you know, if you feel like you need, you don't know enough or you need some support to get to where you want to go, this is a thing for you. Well, uh, dropshipwithjohn.com is the filthy little affiliate link uh, John gave me for that. So if you want to check it out while we're talking, <laughs> dropshipwithjohn, J-O-N, uh, .com, that'd be great. But I, I, like, I want to talk about like this business model. This is exactly how I started. I think this is how you started. Yeah. Um, yep. You know, last episode, we talked about Chic Chandeliers and the 3D printer guy. I think there's been a few other things that I've done throughout this journey. And I think, you know, we both took a, a course back in the day um, and yeah. it was okay. It was it was enough to get started. I wouldn't change where I started for the life of me. Um, nah. But since then, I've watched uh, you know a few other people throw up copycat courses, like literally copycat courses mm. um, that 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 came out of there. They were providing no value. Um, one of them in particular, like, will build stores for you. Um, all of mm-hmm. the stores he had available were like copycats of everything I've mm-hmm. done, which I mm-hmm. thought was hilarious. And I, I don't want to yeah. turn this into like a bashing episode. I just want to talk about our nah. experience. But um, this course you, you've created, you and I both have been asked for years, why don't you go make a better version of this? And so um, <laughs> I, I kind of want to talk about that. Of like, why I can tell you why I didn't, because I am a little bitch and uh, <laughs> doing everything scares the shit out of me. Um, I've had some courses before where nobody logged in ever. Uh, and the people who did would ask questions in a Facebook group, uh, even though they were answered in the course. And so I've just been a little jaded towards courses and a little uh, also, you know, like I said, I'm a little bitch. And so like, I, I'm scared to be in the front of the room. I'm scared to think people are going to look up to me um i have the you know the who am i why am i doing this uh, all the usual suspects which I, i've definitely gotten over over the years um but i don't know i i, I there's i'm sure there's some f- a few other reasons why i didn't just i wanted to make sure i could bring more value if i was ever going to do this and and for the last year i think during covid you and i have talked every friday uh or nearly every friday for a year and this is something we usually would end every call with like so when are we doing this uh when are we gonna get started <laughs> yeah, that's true and that's uh true. And you were, you, you were like, you know, let's, you know, I'm going to knock this out because there's just so much more value we can bring here. And I think you and I have done pretty incredible things uh, that I don't think a lot of people have have, have done uh, in this e-commerce, like retail, you know, selling high ticket things world. Yeah, no, you're right. And and certainly, you know, I mean, I've been hold, I've had people asking me, you know, when are you going to do this for, because I, you know, I've been one-on-one coaching high ticket drop shippers. I've had other programs that, that teach these people marketing and, help them to grow their, their, you know, marketing system for these businesses. And I've always had people ask me like, when are you going to do the full deal? Uh, and I've like you, I've held off on doing it for, for some time, but, and primarily for me, that was, as you say, like there's, there's some, you know, there's some decent content out there already in this space. And we both went through a program, which I, and you know, I'm like you, I don't like to bash other people. I mean, that program's fine for building a business. Right. Um, but the like the last you know three years realistically i constantly have people coming to me going oh i you know i did this and did this program and it, it kind of got me started but i don't know what to do next or i feel like part of the picture's missing and it's just it was just such a constant stream of people like that uh who were then working with me on coaching and other things and i was just like man it kind of feels like this market is underserved at the moment and that's not me saying like everything else out there is crap there definitely is some crap out there on this topic like like you mentioned like there is some people who just went out and blatantly ripped off what was already there and pretended it was their own ideas when it completely wasn't Uh, and i think kind of in a sense as well that kind of put put me doing it i didn't just want people to think i was one of those guys you know what i mean i think on a personal level that was kind of my mental barrier or kind of the story i told myself was like well if i go and do this People are just going to think that I'm, you know, trying to rip off this dude or copying that guy or whatever. And I think that put me off for a long time as well. But I definitely wanted to make sure that if I put something on the market, it would actually, you know, be different. It would be unique. 
and it would add more value than what was already there. Uh, and I think, you know, of all the things I've been working on over the past sort of 18 months to two years, I've kind of got to that point now where this program dropship breakthrough, it is very different both in how it operates, but also the content to anything that's out and anything else that's out there. That's kind of why now that's, that's sort of, that's sort of what it is. It's uh, it just all kind of clicked into place at the right time. And I, yeah, I just figured I got to do it now. Uh, I think it would have, I, I also think it, I just kept feeling it would be one of those things I'd regret if I didn't do it. Cause this is kind of like a, this business model high ticket dropshipping, which not a lot of people know about. It's kind of like the under the radar version of dropshipping, right? I mean, we spent three, three to five years, you know, with this, you know, dropshipping from China, AliExpress, frankly, bullshit. Um, and what, what we were doing was around way long before that, but now everybody here's dropshipping and they associate it with, you know, that sort of dropshipping low ticket trinkets, you know, like little wristbands or whatever, dog toys and stuff like that from China and or, or other sort of, you know, dodgy kind of suppliers. And thankfully that's kind of died in the ass finally. But, you know, I remember that popped up overnight and I was like, what, what, this isn't drop shipping. Like I've been doing, people have been doing what we were doing for like over a decade, but nobody really knows about it, but I love it. It's a business model. I'm super passionate about. I think it has so many benefits, particularly for people who want to get into e-commerce, but don't have any marketing experience or, any you know technical experience with websites or anything like that uh, i think it's just a fantastic business model it changed your and my life significantly um and the thought of never being able to share that with people i think and, and help people experience that say that that same life-changing process uh, i just sat there and i thought man i think i'm really going to regret it if i never do this like it's just going to be one of those things that in 20 years i'd be like oh man why didn't i do that you know what i mean uh, so I think that kind of pushed me on to launching this program as well and just putting it out there. In the spirit of, you know, we talked about Amy Porterfield earlier, who I think does a wonderful podcast and she has a bunch of opinions on podcasts yeah, that, we sh- that you does. should, uh, that you should, you know, offer a free thing like we talked about earlier with every episode. She also says you should give away the what and the why uh, and then ask for payment for the how. Um, and so if you're up for it, I we should literally give your course away right now. Uh, we should walk through all the steps of creating a, a high ticket dropshipping e-commerce business of like how that works uh, and walk through the what and the why. Um, and certainly we don't have the ability to like screen share this, but like it, it truly, it changed my life. Like the ability to do this um, has is it, something I wouldn't change for the world. Like it, it gave me freedom and, and it's a business model that you can start for honestly a few hundred bucks. Uh, and that's not even a joke. It's yeah. going to take some of your time, but it's a few hundred bucks. And so like, I'm totally okay. Like, let's just walk through how this is done. I'm actually building a store right now. I called suppliers earlier today. I was talking to you about it before the call. Um, when that gets to a better place, I'm more than happy to just show everybody here. Here's what it looks like uh, when you do it at a high level. Cause I, I think I'm going to have a monster on my hands. Uh, and so, I, I don't know. I, I'd like to talk through it. Uh, I'd also like to talk through some of the, you know, the big wins and big losses that we have had doing this biz mo- business model and some fortuitous uh, events that happen along the way. And, um, but yeah, I, I truly want to just give this away. Yeah. Cool, well, you're the one here with an offer. I don't know if you want to give it away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's fine. Like, I mean, I've, I've, I've got public stuff out there on a YouTube channel and things like that, where I've talked about, you know, the way of, you know, how you get started and all that sort of business. I mean, you know, I don't have any problem with that. You know, if it, if it helps people who don't want to be in my program and they get on with it anyway, that's, that doesn't bother me one little bit. I'm not one of these people. I don't like, I don't pretend right. That this is like some Uber secret that I've, I'm not one of these cool guys. And I hate it when guys do this. They're like, yeah, I'm a, I've uncovered this secret that nobody else knows how to do this thing. And if you take my course, you'll learn it. It's absolute bullshit, right? There's no secrets in any form of marketing at this point. There's not. There's no business models that are secret. There's nothing. If you want to go out and learn it yourself, literally you can, right? The benefit of buying a program is that you're going to get it all in one place from somebody you can trust and you're going to get the support to actually make it happen. I mean, that's that's the difference with with joining like a program like uh, Dropship Breakthrough. You get the group coaching, you get all of that sort of stuff and that helps a lot of people, right? Without that, without that structure, without that accountability and all that, they don't get started. Whereas some people, sure, they'll go out and learn it themselves. If you want to go out and cobble together 200 YouTube videos on how to do all of this, you probably could, right? So, you know, I'm not going to pretend like this is some uber secret, right? The people, the only way they must learn is by buying a program. 
it just makes life a lot easier if you do. <laughs> I also just know that like, you know, Gary Vee always says this when he's in a room. He's like, I'm going to give away everything I have because I know maybe, maybe one of you in this room is actually going to do something about it. And so, you know, not to, not to talk down to my audience. It's just like, I, I don't know. I've, I've, I've tried to help so many people, uh, especially like family and friends, like get started and, uh, you got to have your mind right. And so like, look, I'm totally okay giving it all away. I I, I want to use an example. And I think the best example is one that we make fun of constantly, which is e-bikes. Um, I think sure. I've seen <laughs> a thousand e-bike drop shipping stores in my lifetime. Yep. Um, so Me what too. do you, like, what do you say we like on a podcast, build an e-bike store or like walk through the steps? Yeah. Well, I mean the first, the first step is actually working out that you want to sell e-bikes. So you know, I mean, you're getting into high ticket drop shipping. You know, you've got to, it, it kind of starts with identifying the market that your business is going to operate in, you know, the products that you're going to sell, the customers you're going to serve, who your competition is and all that sort of thing. And there's definitely a method for picking the right types of products to sell on your site, right? I mean, obviously we, we keep saying high ticket drop shipping. So, you know, you're kind of aiming for products that are, you know, you might aim for an average product price of around $1,000. Um, you can definitely have products in there that are way more than that. I mean, I've sold ten thousand dollar products, fifteen thousand dollar products. I know you've done the same, selling super expensive products and bundles of products on on sites that you've been into before. And um, so you're definitely. I mean, that's that's kind of one of the rules. I mean, the, the the benefit of the model is that you're selling these expensive products and you're making, in dollar terms, a, a quite a high mark, like quite a high amount of profit on each sale. So you don't do the volume. You don't have to do the volume that you would do on a low ticket site. You know, if you're selling twenty dollar trinkets, you got to sell a shitload of twenty dollar trinkets, right? You sell something for five grand with a thirty percent margin. You don't have to sell a lot of those products to you know replace your income or do do something like that. So it's much more. It's it's a much more manageable system because of that for an individual to get started in. Because if you're selling twenty dollar things and you got to sell five thousand of them a month to make a dollar, you got to have a huge team in place to support that business, right? So it's it's actually a bit of a nightmare. Whereas if you're selling the expensive stuff, it's totally possible for one person to run that business and grow it to a level where it provides them a, a good stable income. You know, and if you want to go past that, you can. So yeah, I think uh, I did skip a step there when we said let's let's talk about e bikes. It's like you know, <laughs> figure out what to sell. Um, I know this was this was difficult for me. I I was told everything that I do in a day, whatever I see in my home or wherever I'm going, that is over 200. I think is what they said. Uh, I would highly recommend try to go over a, a, a thousand um, or up near a thousand, um, but see what you see, right? And so I think my list came out to be. I think Pellet Grill stood out to me. My ex wife's family. The guy was the national sales rep for a Pellet Grill brand. Um, and he was cooking on his pellet grill every time we went over there. And so that stood out to me. Um, I sold 3d printers back in the day that, uh, was an obvious one. Um, but I would definitely like make a list throughout the day. What do you, what do you run into that is high end and, and don't, don't worry about what it is. Not try not to do electronics. If you can like TVs don't make sense. Um, but write down everything that you run into, and that's a, a, a good place to start. Another place to start is uh, the biggest dropshipper in the world is Wayfair.com. Uh, and so if you are running out of ideas, go to Wayfair. They literally sell everything at this point, um, and everything that you see on their website is dropshippable. Yeah. And that, I mean, they're a funny story. People are like, you know, shitting on dropshipping all the time and that sort of thing. Wayfair started out as, as a collection of high-ticket dropshipping sites, like the exact business model we're talking about. They're now Wayfair. Like those dudes, they started, you know, I don't know, 15 years ago or something like that. But it was just a couple of dudes had a collection of high ticket dropshipping businesses. They combined them into one and it became Wayfair. And, you know, I don't know. It's They, they used to be in Australia. They're not here anymore. But, uh, you know, over there, they're becoming, I don't know, last I heard their revenues were like $500 million a year or more. So, like, you know. Uh, it's it's totally legitimate. And they still drop ship. Not everything they do is drop shipping, but you know, they still drop shit. But uh, yeah, you go out, you do some research, look around. What do you do? What do your friends do? Um, I try to tell people as well as thinking about the price to sort of think about um, products that help somebody fulfill an interest that they have. All right. So, um, you know, like to use an example, I mean, I'm a surfer. If I'm, if I'm somebody who's into surfing, yeah, I need to buy surfboards. 
I'm going to buy surfboards. You know, now they're not the highest of ticket products, but as an example, you want to find examples like that where you have a really definable um, audience or, or target customer who is buying that thing because they want to, not because they need to. All right? And the reason I like that is because it makes the marketing so much easier. It makes everything easier if you're talking to people about something they're passionate about rather than just like some, oh, boring God, I've got to buy this thing. I don't really want it, but I've got to buy it. Like those everyday, everyday type items are usually super competitive um, and they're just, they're a bit of a pain to market. Whereas if you can, so like e-bikes, for example, people don't have to have an e-bike, right? I mean, if we're going to use this as our example product, people buy e-bikes, why? Um, you know, because they might be passionate about being environmentally friendly or, you know, they enjoy, you know, using that as a mode of transport to work or school or wherever they go. Um, you know, so there's, there's probably a range of different interests there and I'm by no means an expert on that market. Um, Me either. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, nobody needs to have an e-bike. It's not a required day-to-day -day item. People buy it because they want to, right? And so that's the type of product that I recommend people look for. Um, you know, products that people get because they want to you know, um, rather than because they need to, you know, like, so you could sell wine coolers, wine cellar coolers, things like that, right? Who are you going to sell them to? People who are passionate about wine, who collect wine, right? And they need that. They want that thing so that they can preserve their wine in the best condition so that they can enjoy it at another time or so they can sell it down the track because they, they're an investor in that sort of thing. These are the sort of products you're looking for. Um, so you want that price, you want to find products where the market, where, where you've got a good, because I mean, at the end of the day, it's all about the customer, right? So you want to have a good market to sell to. And then you're looking at, you, you know, you've got some other things in mind. You know, I mean, like you said, you want to avoid product uh, or markets that are dominated by, um, you know, household name brands, right? So you use the example of TVs, or, or elect, like, I don't actually think electronics are, are a problem. I've sold electronics. It's not actually a problem from the product perspective. It's a problem because a lot of those electronic or consumer electronics, they're dominated by brands like Sony, like LG. Now, those guys are not going to drop ship for you as your supplier. They're too big. So my rule is, is usually if you know the name of the brands that you see when you're doing your research on your product and you don't use the product, like you automatically recognize them, then that's not a good idea because they're too big. Whereas what you're looking for is brands that, let's go back to the example of surfing. Right? Now there's going to be a whole bunch of manufacturers that make surfboards that you, you're not a surfer, you've never heard of them before, right? But me as a surfer, I know them all, right? Because I'm passionate about it. And so you say brand names to me, I, yeah, they make great surfboards, right? I automatically know them and they're recognized in the market. And so when I need to buy a surfboard, I'm going to go and look for those brands. That's what you want. You want, you want brands that are recognized within their market, but not outside of their market. And once again, the reason for that is because it makes the marketing a lot easier for those products when you get to that point in time. I like that you say that, man. I've never thought of it that way. Like it, if, if if you ask me for TV brand names, I could name a bunch of them right now, right? Yeah. Um, and I'm yeah, not sure. necessarily in the in the market for a TV. Uh, but if you ask me about inflatable paddle boards, um, I couldn't tell you I couldn't tell you a single brand off the top of my head, right? But if somebody's in the market shopping for those, um, that's when brand discovery actually matters. Yeah, yeah. So you do, you, if if possible, you do want to get into a brand into into spaces where there is. There are brands, right? But they're just not massive, massive brands. So, yeah, TVs, they're too big. Uh, that's, you know, fridges, air, like uh, washing machines. I mean, these are not things you want to drop ship because they're all dominated by the same big, big brands. Um, you know, but, yeah, you, you want to ha – having brands in your space is important. And, and that's the thing to say about this model is, you know, if you don't know it, uh, you're, looking, you're, you're looking to work with suppliers. So the people you're going to get your drop – your, your products from who exist in the country that you're selling in, right? We're not talking about getting stuff from overseas, cheap stuff from China and sending it in. What you're going to be working with brands that have been on the market for 20 years, 30 years, some cases, maybe a hundred years. You know, they're well-established, they're valuable brands within their market. And this is kind of one of the benefits of this, 
of this type of dropshipping is that you're only working with really well-established and stable companies, right? Um, who already have a recognized presence of their own. And you're kind of using that and adding it to your own brand and kind of running off the back of all of that, the, the value that they've built around their brand and the trust that's already instilled in their brand. You're kind of piggybacking along with that in the beginning. Um, and that's, you know, kind of, I think why, one of the benefits to this uh, type of drop shipping, but um, yeah. So you, you know, you're looking products at a certain price that meet a need that somebody has or, or wants uh, to fulfill that have brands that aren't too big. You probably think a little bit about shipping. Now this is a bit of a contentious one. You know, you, you're going to end up shipping these products and shipping's a cost. And so if possible, you would try, you try and avoid really big products, right? This is the thing with expensive products. They're often really large, right? Or they can be really large and really heavy. You don't want to have to be shipping something that weighs a thousand pounds, right? See, I um, disagree with you there, man. Like it's yeah, better yeah. So dealing dealing caveat. with like dealing with like UPS having something in a small box makes a ton of it, it it removes some headaches for you. However, that's a barrier, right? So the more barriers you can put in between when you choose a product here, the harder it is for Joe Bag of Donuts to come in after you, right? So the more barriers, the better, in my opinion. Like uh, Andrew Udarian, he was on this podcast back uh, like episode seventeen or something like that. He used to own TrollingMotors.net, um, and uh, you know Trolling Motors can get big, um, and they're complex. And he used to own uh, RightChannelRadios.com, right? Super complex on knowing which. Uh, CB radio or uh, he might have sold ham radios back then there was a complexity factor there that set him apart if you had to go build a product page and explain why someone should choose one of these things um, that's an effort some people aren't willing to take right so the more of these barriers and, and shipping is one if you are willing to solve the freight shipping and I'm gonna call it what it is headache um, you know or can be a headache then you are putting a barrier between you and other people and 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 uh, the water gets uh bluer right you're not you're not in a you're not in a, a red ocean oh, yeah. you're in a blue ocean totally totally but there are some realities around it so the caveat i was going to say is if you're going to go for really heavy items and it's more the weight than the dimensions that tends to be a problem and i'm not just talking about just in the us so i'm talking to people if you're in australia this is an even bigger problem uh if you're in the bigger problems like that as well um it, they need to be more expensive there are some realities if you're selling an 800 dollars product that weighs a shit ton there is no way around that because you don't have the margin in it to pay for the shipping, right? That's just the, there's no fix to that unless you're going to invent a new mode of transporting that thing that doesn't exist right now. Maybe you're working on teleporting technology. I don't know. There's no fix to that. I don't, and you're right. You're right though. It does finding things where there's layers of complexity that you're willing to unpick that nobody else is. That's that. I agree. Right. And that, that is one of the things about this model that I like is that a lot of people look at the products that we sell and go, oh my God, that looks like a nightmare to sell. I'm just going to go and sell this little tiny, you know, pair of shoes over here or, you know, something like that, right? But there, there's still some realities around the margin you're going to get drop shipping and what you can do with that, how many overheads you can absorb into that, right? I just wouldn't so want to, dis- I just wouldn't want to discourage anybody, right? Like uh, I sold uh, for a brief time uh, pitching machines shit fucking margins like five to seven percent margins uh which is nothing uh, even on a five thousand dollar pitching machine um however they had factored in the shipping costs right and so uh they would pay shipping on those um so there was yeah and, you know, and sometimes to, that happens yeah there was only five to seven percent to play with in order to get them uh get a sale which sucked um yeah, which is why i'm not sucks. selling pitching machines anymore even though i'm a giant baseball fan um but um, you know, some, some manufacturers have this solve for you. So not all do, I just don't want to discourage anybody. I know in the beginning I had a really hard time thinking of a market to go into or, a, or a niche as everybody wanted to call it. Um, and so just to give anyone who's listening ideas of like, uh, just, just again, go to Wayfair furniture, sofas, love seats, sectionals, accent chairs, uh, headboards, nightstands, dining tables, uh, office desks, bookcases. I sold standing desk. Brian Angel was on the show. We sold standing desk. Um, he'll, you know, if you listen to his second episode, he'll tell you why you probably shouldn't go into standing desk. Uh, but, uh, beanbag chairs, gaming chairs, uh, outdoor, there's outdoor seating and patio, uh, grills, sandboxes, swing sets, trampolines, pergolas, canopies, mailboxes, bird baths, sheds. This is all just stuff on, on Wayfair's mega menu here, right? Uh, and there's bedding and bath and rugs and, and decor and lighting, uh, which you sold, John. Um, 
out indoor outdoor lighting uh kitchen stuff as far as like uh you know high end cutting boards or um uh whatever those like carts are called in the middle of your uh of of your kitchen um cribs there's all kinds of like baby products renovation uh like vanities bathroom sinks um uh different types of fireplaces and cabinet hardware which you'd be shocked at how much that stuff goes for um and then i try to i do try to stay away from the appliances which they have some appliances on here i'm not sure i would go there but i've seen you know kegerators and ice makers uh heck i think i even have a development store ice maker one if uh if somebody wants that it's partially built you can have it um and then there's uh some some pet stuff like dog crates and and uh cat condos um there's there's just endless amounts of things that that fit into this criteria and again i know when i started I had a really hard time thinking of this stuff. And even as I coach people, and maybe you notice this when you coach people too, John, it seems like everybody comes up with the same like 10, 15 ideas out of the gates. Um, so whatever you come up with out of the gates, probably don't do those things. You know why that happens often? Because every every doofus, right, that already had, and, and I'll, I'll shit on people for this. Every doofus that has a program thinks they're going to grease the wheels for people and go, uh, and this year I'm going to give you my list of the top 200 niches to drop ship in. What a fucking stupid idea is that? So you're going to give your students a list of things that you tell them they should do. What do you think is going to happen? Everybody's going to do the top 10 on that list, right? Everybody's going to do the top 10. This is why e-bikes, there's so many sites in it because it was in everybody's top 10 products to drop ship list. So everybody goes and does it. They don't think for themselves and they all end up in the same niche. They're competing with each other. Now there's 30 stores. They all look the same. They're all selling exactly the same products and What's going to happen? Customers are going to pick one or two of those sites. The rest are going to fail. It's the stupidest practice. So for anyone who joins my program, you're not getting a list of niches to go and sell in. You're going to go and do the work yourself. You're going to work it out yourself with our support, but we're not going to give it to you. This was the downside of all of those copycat courses, right? Like yeah. this came out in the first course. Uh, it was one of their marketing methods of a lead magnet. You know, here's top yeah. 100. And it works. It's a great lead magnet, right? For somebody who doesn't know what they're talking about. Yeah. Right? And then, Joe Bag of Donuts number one copied it and did the exact same thing. Joe Bag of Donuts number two and number three and number four. Um, man, I, I someday we should just call them all out. They're they're all garbage. Yeah, well, um, but this is why you're doing what you're doing. This is why you're creating the that, course you that, are. That it's, list, it's that fun, list yeah. of products that you just rattled off from uh, Wayfair or whatever you're looking at there. I mean, there are at least ten in there. At least ten in there that I've either worked on or seen other people work on that are multi million dollar stores a year in revenue. At least ten right? That I've seen in my time. So you just rattled off a whole bunch of names right there, a whole bunch of product types that, that, that work. And you did that in about 10 seconds, right? Now, so coming up with the ideas, it's not actually that hard, but you're right. This is this, this of of the whole process. This is the bit where people get the most stuck, right? Everybody's looking for a golden idea or the, the perfect idea or something like that. It doesn't exist. There's no perfect market to sell. There's no perfect products to sell. Um, there's a lot of good ones. There's some bad ones, but that's it. So this is this this choosing your products and your market is not the thing you want to get stuck on because you can go around researching and doing this for months on end, just going around in circles in your head, second guessing yourself and all that. You want to keep the criteria to select the products really simple because as long as you avoid the bad ones, everything else is more or less the same, right? In terms of the chances of success, you know where I saw the people that were most successful, though, where I, I might say is different is like the people who were involved with what they were selling, right? So I can assume somebody who loves to cook being able to sell some of the things in the kitchen um, to other people who love to cook. They're going to speak the same language. They're going to actually want to wake up and work on this business every day. Uh, the company I exited, the 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 golf company, those guys fucking love golf. They live and breathe golf, right? And so it was easy for them to work on this business every day. And there's a few other that, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure they would appreciate I didn't mention them, but they are in the industry. They are those people. Um, and, and that's why I think they have a slight bit more success. Um, and honestly, as somebody who has consulted with them or coached them, um, it's way more fun to work with those people too. They're just passionate. They want to learn. They, yeah. they wake up every day. Whereas like, if I look at, you know, just this rugs, I, I don't give a shit what my rug looks like. Uh, you know, it really ties the room together. That's all I care. Um, and then, you know, <laughs> some of the other products that are on here, canopies and gazebos like that, it just doesn't like get me excited. Right. And where I think, you know, try to find some things that actually get you excited. 
If if you can, yes. But here's the thing. I mean, not everybody has something they're excited about that has high ticket products in it. So I don't think that's about I agree with you. If if that exists for you, then that's cool. Do it. Do it. I mean, if you do identify a thing where it's got the right sort of products in it and it's something you're passionate about, then absolutely don't avoid that. Do it. Get in there. Because yes, it does. There's a lot of advantages there for you. But that example you just used, gazebos, right? I work with on a business with some other guys that sells a million dollars a month in gazebos and not a single one of us gives a toss about gazebos. I don't own one. The other guys live in apartments in cities. Like who gives a shit about gazebos, right? I don't, right? Still selling a million bucks a month in revenue of just gazebos on a site that sells other things as well, right? High ticket drop shipping. So Yes, if you've got a passion, I think it's great to pursue it, but that shouldn't be a barrier either if you don't. Um, because my first slide, I'm selling my first slide, I'm selling crystal chandeliers, right? Ah, mate, I'd never buy one to save myself, right? I don't care about them, but that 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 business got me out of my career. It replaced my income, and I sold it for a six-figure amount. Regret? No, absolutely not. Um, you know, so. I'd say, yeah, if you've got a passion, follow it. But if you don't, don't, once again, don't let that be a wall, like what we were talking about with the shipping stuff. Don't put, have that as a barrier. It can still work absolutely fine for you if you don't, if you don't have that sort of, like if you can't find something that you're passionate about that fits the, the other sort of criteria you're, you're looking at here. When you're first starting, you are looking for every reason to, to stop, right? Like it's so uncomfortable. And so I'm glad you addressed that because like, uh, I know, you know, niche selection, niche selection, market selection, whatever you want to call it, was a barrier for me. It, it took a long time. Calling suppliers, which is what we'll get to next, that sucked <laughs> in the beginning, right? And now it's pretty, pretty easy. Um, and so, the, like, you're always looking for a reason to stop. So, John's right. You know, don't whatever. If you're researching a market, don't. If you're not passionate about it, don't let it be a reason that you don't go into it. Um, but I, I, look, I will say it was easier. I've been in some companies where I enjoyed. I enjoyed the stuff. It was it was easier every day to think about it. It was easier every day to wonder how to reach more people. And you just have more insight, right? When I was in the 3D printer market, I, I, I wasn't a guy who wanted a 3D printer. thought they were neat. Um, but the engineers I, were, I was talking to, um, I don't relate to those people. So it was very difficult to think how could I reach more of those people and how could I speak their language and um, – but it's all marketing in the end. So yeah, John's right. Don't let it be a barrier. Um, but we're getting diverted, John, as we normally do in yeah, our conversations. Are. Look, I'll, I'll run through the, the criteria that I talk about. So you're looking for the price. You want to. Uh, you're making sure it's a. You're, you're looking for uh, markets where you're dealing with with customers who are passionate. And I think that's where the passion's more important. Actually, that makes your business easier is if you're dealing with customers who are passionate about what you're selling. All right. If you can be passionate about it too, great. Not a must. It's much better if your customers are because at the end of the day, it's your customer that matters, right? You know, because they're the ones that are going to open that. You're not opening your wallet for yourself. Your customers are opening their wallet for you. They're putting their trust in you. So you're aiming for that. You're not, you're, you're avoiding markets where the brands are too big, household name brands. Um, think, have a think about the shipping. But as Ben said, it's, it's, not, it's not a barrier. Um, but as I say, if you're going to go really heavy, go more expensive. Um, the next thing which is really important is to look at the competition that already exists in that market. I think this is one that gets a bit underserved. Like uh, you don't want to go into a market where it's, where it's super competitive. So for example, um, if you can avoid it, right? Once again, so using an example, lighting, like home lighting, which was one that I was in when I first got started. If I went back and did that again, I wouldn't pick that as a product to sell again. Right, there were better options on my list at that time in hindsight that I could have got into, Sephika, because I screwed up a lot in that in the beginning, and it was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be, right? Because of and it was because of that factor because I jumped into a market that was super competitive, ad costs were high, and all of that sort of thing, and it kind of um, kind of slowed me down a lot. So you, if you've got a series of ideas on on your list that you've brainstormed up. You look at how much competition is out there and you can do that simply by just going to Google uh, and doing Google searches for the type of products that you want to sell and see how many people are running ads on those products. So click into the Google shopping tab, see how many websites are running ads. And if you're seeing like 30 advertisers, 40 advertisers, 50 advertisers, it's too much. 
aim for less than 20 if you can, All right? Uh, and so if you've got a, a, a few ideas on your list that you think look really good and one's super competitive, one's not so competitive and one there's no competitors, pick the middle one, All right? Don't pick the one with tons of competition. Don't pick the one with no competition because that means it's not a popular market. Get in that nice, healthy place, less than 20 competitors, you'll be right. So you check that off. Another thing that I like to look for and I think is super important, which once again, other programs don't really talk about is I try to go into markets where there's recurring revenue potential, right? Once again, this is not really a getting started thing. It's a down the track thing, right? What what you want to try and avoid is going to markets where you can only sell to each customer once in their lifetime. So you have no lifetime value. Um, Now you can make those work, and you can make money in, in markets where to each one wants. And this is the thing with high ticket products, right? Usually high ticket products last a long time, right? So if somebody comes and buys a $2,000 product off you, they're not going to buy that exact same product again for five to 10 years often, right? So you, that means that every customer you acquire, you're basically, you need paid, you're going to pay for in some way. Whereas if you have potential to sell customers a second time, a third time on a similar product, uh, a, an accessory product or some sort of related product, then you can keep marketing to your existing customers and get more sales. And that's way easier. Selling The easiest person to sell to is a customer. It's not somebody who's never heard of you before, right? And there's also more profit on those secondary and third sales because usually you make them via email marketing, Uh, and things like that, which is super low cost, right? So your profit margin's higher. And at the end of the day, that's one of the three ways you grow any business is to increase your rate of repeat business, right? So if you want to grow a long way uh, with this, I actually get people to look at that aspect as well. Can you see that there's potential for over time, you don't have to do it right in the beginning, but over time to bring other products into into that market that you can sell to them. So as an example of that, um, you know, something I'm into is, um, you know, I, I do a lot of off-roading in my four-wheel drive. You know, I bought a bunch of accessories for my four-wheel drive. It goes on. They're all quite expensive things, right? Uh, and they would all be drop shippable, and they are. Uh, so I, I wouldn't pick just one of those products to sell, right? Uh, because that customer is looking for other things to buy as well. Um, and if I just focus on selling just one thing, I'm missing opportunities, right? So in that in that example, like the market is a dude who loves to go off-roading. You want to look at what are all the things you can sell that dude? And that's going to be your site, right? Because you've got recurring revenue potential there. And then finally, I'd be having a look at the, and, and this once again is a fine, fairly minor thing. I'd be looking at the, at, at, at the sort of how, getting an idea, doing some basic research on the web traffic that exists for, you know, the product types, like how many people are out there searching on, on Google and search engines for the type of products you're looking for. Um, uh, once again, that that's less of a minor thing because if you're going into a space with established brands and all that sort of thing, there's going to generally be enough web traffic. But for, for high ticket drop shipping, your primary marketing channel is search, right? Search engines. It's not Facebook ads. It's not social media. It's search. And this is one of the difference between high ticket drop shipping and low ticket drop shipping. Um, search is your biggest friend here. And so you want to see how many people on a a day-to-day basis are getting onto a search engine and typing searches that are related to the products you want to sell. The more, the merrier, right? So that's basically it. That's my criteria. I keep it, I like to keep it simple. Uh, If you can tick enough boxes there, you've got a good idea, you should just go and get started with it. And that's the biggest thing to picking your market, right? People get it so turned around in in so many ways. But the reality here is you just need to get started. It's never going to be perfect when you start, right? The most important thing is just to get started. So you want to move through this stage, just avoid the bad ideas, get a good idea and get started with the rest of the process. So you and I have discussed uh, how 
usually we have like slightly different opinions on on things and i think it's hilarious when we start arguing so every friday john and i chat and we argue about some of these things we usually come to a conclusion that we're kind of saying the same thing but we have like a different take on it um so literally while you're talking i'm, I'm sitting over here like well eh, i would look at it a little differently i might do it a little bit differently i think people should just you know start right like uh, get started i think sometimes the more niche the better right like if you can get really really targeted and i think you can sell them other shit that doesn't necessarily need to be another product although i've been part of some you know super stores if you will right and i'm building one right now that sells all kinds of different things to the same person um which could be a monster but i don't know if i would start there and so literally while we're talking uh last friday we were like should we start a Patreon of like charge per episode, whether it be like one bucks, <laughs> one buck, 10 bucks per episode, whatever it is, yeah. and just discuss what we know and like have these arguments and, and, and just put it out there. So while we're talking, I bought dropshippodcast.com. Um, I'm also a URL hoarder, so this might just end up sitting in my name cheap forever, <laughs> you uh, are, you are. but I bought it, man. <laughs> Dropshippodcast.com, uh, possibly coming soon on Patreon. If you guys are interested, yeah, let's do it, mate. I've already told you. Let's do I'm I'm the opposite of you. I don't I never try and convince myself why I shouldn't do things. I'm the opposite end of the spectrum. If I if I feel good about something instantly, I'm like, heck yeah, let's go and do it. So I'm saying to that idea, everybody can hear it. I'm putting Ben on the spot. Heck yeah, let's go and do it. If we don't do it, it's because Ben bitched out. All right. How about this? If if you think this is a good idea, if you want to hear John and I literally talk about everything drop shipping, um, which is the world we both live in, uh, send me an email. Uh Ben at BenKnagendorf.com. If that's too hard, go to info at the BK show.com. If that's too hard, send me a TM on Twitter or on Facebook or whatever. I want to know if anybody would be interested in this. I think, you know, it would be a Patreon style. So I would, we would charge per episode uh, where we would, you know, probably reveal a little bit more about our businesses and what we're doing and why it works and do some, you know, Q and A's and things like that. And so, uh, I don't know, five bucks, 10 bucks an episode or something like that. Do like four episodes a month. If that's something you would pay for, uh, literally pay for, uh, I want to know. So sh- shoot me a DM. Uh, let me know. Cause I think, uh, you and I, again, we argue about everything, mate. Like every, every Friday we have some sort of argument about whatever we're talking about, but it's all out of love. Like we're just having fun. And, uh, I think we banter about it. anyway, back to, uh, back to giving this away. Uh, so if we did all that, you might settle on e-bikes. You probably shouldn't at this point. There's so many of them. Um, but let's just say we settled on e-bikes and we think e-bikes is a great thing to do. Uh, what now? What do we do next? Yeah, so you think it's a great thing to do next. Um, you know, you go through a little step where you'll just do a bit of research. Other sell e-bikes and you'll identify the the brands or the suppliers that exist in that space and make a list of those. Right? So just get a get a spreadsheet, put their names down, find their websites, get their contact details and just put it in a list, save that and leave it, right? So, you know, in most in most uh, markets there's going to be, you know, 20, 30 brands in there that you could sell. So you're just looking to find those. Now, some people would say to you, just look for other dropshipping sites and just target the brands that they have. That's a mistake. You want to make a list of all the brands you can find, whether you think they dropship or not, right? So once again, if you just focus on only the brands that other people sell, you're likely missing opportunities. And I know this because I've done it many times. There are many brands out there who you won't see on other dropshipping sites, but when you actually call them and have a conversation, they're like, oh, yeah, actually, we might do that. And then you get access to a brand that nobody else is selling uh, with the same business model as you, and that's great. So you just find all the brands in, in your chosen market that you can find, that, that manufacture or distribute or import the sort of product that you want to sell. You put them on a list. You get their contact details, you save it for later. The next step after you've done that is you're going to build your website, right? And this is the bit that a lot of people who come into this for the first time think is a bit counterintuitive, right? Usually because they think that building a website is a lot harder than it actually is in reality. Um, But because a lot of people say, well, why do you build a website before you even know if you've got products to sell and anything like that? And there is a good reason, right? So what you're going to do after you build your website is you're going to start contacting those those brands that whose products you want to sell. Now, we're, because we're not talking about getting cheap shit from AliExpress or Alibaba, those brands actually do care about whether you're a legitimate business or not, right? So they have a brand themselves, which might have just goodwill in it that's worth millions of dollars, right? They're not giving that away for free to any Joe Blogs who woke up in the morning in his pajamas with a bright idea and thought, oh, I'm going to sit here eating my Fruit Loops and I'm going to call supplies, right? They're not interested in that. They, they want to work with you, but only if you're committed 
only if you've taken some steps to actually build a business. So we build the website first. You get your branding sorted. You go to Fiverr. You find a logo designer on Fiverr. You get you pick a name for your business. You get logos and things made up. $20, $30, $40, something like that, right? Then you come in, you build your website. You set it up so that it looks like and so that it is a functioning e-commerce website that you can then point supp- the supplies to when you call them and say, hey, this is our URL. This is, this is where our site's going to be. You can go and check it out and see what it's going to look like when your products are on there. Um, and suppliers think, oh, okay, well, they've built a website. They're actually serious about doing this, right? So we generally, and I know Ben will support this. I mean, I recommend people use Shopify for their sites. Um, you know, BenConnectNorth.com slash Shopify. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Get Benny's affiliate link there if you haven't if you haven't got if you haven't started yet. Um, the reason for that is, you know, look, I use WordPress for other business models. People always ask, "Oh, why don't you use WordPress? Or why don't you use Magento? Why don't you use Big Commerce or something like that?" You could use all of those things. I'll be clear: you absolutely could use all of those things. You could put out a decent website that'll make sales and blah blah blah. But Shopify offers for somebody who's new to online marketing, for somebody who's new to e-commerce, for somebody who hasn't set up a website before, which is most people who come into high ticket dropshipping, Shopify offers the best mix of user friendliness, cost effectiveness, and a good result for your customer, right? Hands down. And I've tried them all, literally. I've tried them all. Yes, WordPress has advantages over Shopify, but it's a fuckload harder to use excuse the language, if you've never set up a website before. The learning curve is much steeper. Don't even get started on Magento, the cost and steepness of that learning curve, whereas Shopify is easy. You can get in there, set up your account, build a website. Literally, I mean, I can do it in a day. I mean, I've done it a lot of times, but it's literally that quick for me now to set up an e-commerce website that looks great on Shopify, right? So, and the day-to-day usability of it is phenomenal, and really, when you're getting into the grind of your business, that's what you want. You don't want every action you take in that back end to be a nightmare. And it is with some of those other platforms. So I feel like I should save this for a dropship podcast, uh, Patreon, <laughs> patreon.com. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I feel like I should save this, but I would argue again. I So I don't build out a full store or even a fake store. I might have a, a homepage, um, but that's about it, really. I, like uh, I called suppliers today on a site you know about. Um, there's nothing there. And I'm okay with that. And I, you know, obviously, I, maybe I know how to bullshit more than most people, but I end up being honest of just like, here's where I'm going. Here's the experience I have. And if you have no experience, that's hard. Yeah, even yeah. then you can be like, here's where I want to go. Um, just all the, all the supplier cares when you call them is that you aren't like a fly by night guy who wants to flip these on eBay or, or try to, you know, like, or realized, uh, you know, if I call them and get their pricing that I can order one of these for myself at a discount. Um, they they want to know you're real. They want to know that you're in it for the long haul. Yeah. So I don't actually build Definitely. out the website. Um, and then regarding Shopify, benconnectorf.com slash Shopify. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I love Shopify. I think it's the only, only answer out there. And I would fight you on like whether WordPress has advantages over Shopify. So I'm just over here taking notes of all the things we can argue about uh, behind a paywall at some point. Yeah. Look, I mean, don't get me wrong. Uh, there, there are undeniably advantages to WordPress over Shopify, I, but they don't stack up for my site, which is why I've never used WordPress for an e-commerce site. Right? I'm not. I'm not arguing with you there. Um, but Those are fighting words, dude. It's only because you don't know how to <laughs> use WordPress because you're, you're a right. bloody troglodyte. You're right. I mate. don't know what I'm doing. And, and this WordPress. is why people should use Shopify because most people are like Ben Kenegendorf. They're an idiot, basically, <laughs> uh, when it when it comes to technology. But I love you know, when it's a tech. You know, I don't know about Ben, but. Uh, you know, so it's the best option. Um, look, in terms of how you build up the website at this stage, I mean, definitely I don't pretend anything. And I know there's other programs out there that do like recommend you pretend you're a business that's been established for years or something like that and basically lie to people when you call them. Anytime you lie in your business, it's the wrong thing to do, obviously. Would, would you lie to your, you know, your friends, your, your family? No, of course you wouldn't. So why would you lie to somebody else? That's silly, right? If you build a business based on lies generally it's not going to be a successful business or you're not going to be successful if that's your mindset. So, but I, I just, I mean, it's just, a, a, it's a question of order what we're talking about. You're going to end up setting up that website anyway. I just do it all in one go rather than coming back and doing it later. So there's not really any difference. So 
before I call suppliers, I have a website that's about 80% of what it will be when it goes live to customers. It's not fully complete, no, but it's about 80% there. So that, but how much you set up, it's not really a big deal, right? Yeah, a couple, a couple tips there. Um, let's say I'm calling, and I'm just looking through some e-bike website. Let's say I'm calling EcoTrick. Um, one thing I will do is upload one of their products, and I'll show them, here's what it's going to look like on my site. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I have my own way. I, I'm very, very good at SEO at this point. And so I'll set it up the way I want to set it up. And I'll set up one. And I'll, you know, I'll have, I'll make a pretty link, uh, you know, mysite.com slash whatever, just so they can get there quickly. And I'll say, this is what your product's going to look like on my site. Here's the value I think I can bring. And uh, and I'll show them what it's going to look like. And then number two, when you're actually calling these suppliers. So I did this today and I was che- teaching an employee of mine how to do this. Um, call them. Every time, call them. Pick up the phone and talk to them. You are building a real relationship here. And so you might go to a site that says become a dealer and you'll click on it and it'll say email us at partners at you know, ebikecompany.com uh, and let us know and, and we'll get back to you. Don't, don't do it. Don't cop out. Uh, it's really, really easy. Again, like there's all these moments where you are going to want to quit uh, or it's scary and you got to push through that. So kiss the girl, put the number in your phone and call them. Be, you know, stand up uh, for like what you're trying to live here. You're trying to build a business to change your life. It's going to take relationships and you have to build relationships with these brands so that they trust you, you trust them, uh, and it's going to pay dividends in the long run. Call them every single time. Yep, absolutely. So, yeah, and and that's sort of the next step. So you build your website and, you know, in my program, you get the step-by-step on how to do that um, in a good way. Uh, And then the next bit is you're going to go back to that list you build of the suppliers in in your market. And you're going to pick up the phone and start calling them and having a conversation with them to, you know, uh, get their approval to list their products on your site and sell them. So you're starting a relationship there with those suppliers. Um, you know, some are going to say no. You're going to get rejected. <laughs> it's a normal part of business, I know. And and this is once again, this is the next part. People get tripped up on p- finding the right products to sell. People get tripped up on com- contacting the suppliers because it is probably the first kind of confronting action that you have to take in the business, right? Uh, you're going to start putting yourself out there to other people, and for for a lot lot of people, that's a confronting thing to do. I get that. I was super nervous the first time I did this, like crazy nervous. Um, but as Ben said, you just got to do it. Um, some people say, oh, I'll just I'll just email them all. For for starters, you most people don't open all of their emails. So whether or not it's the best way to contact somebody and, and seek their, uh, to start a relationship with them, half the people you email won't even look at your email. So how are you going to be successful doing that? Um, now, sometimes you'll look at a supplier and they'll have an online application they want you to submit. I would recommend doing that because they're saying they want you to do that and you that but you also still call them right at the same time right so yeah you've absolutely got to get on the phone and call them you're going to be speaking to people in the country that you're going to be selling in uh, it's easy to pick up the phone and call them during business hours um, and yeah it's a really it's actually a really simple conversation you know um, it's not actually a complex conversation it's really just getting on the phone with them, introducing yourself and your business, um, letting them know sort of the method that your business is going to operate on and just asking the question, are you cool if we you know, list your products on our site and sell them for you? Uh, and you know, a lot of people come to that conversation from the perspective that they feel like they're begging for something, but it's really not. Like the person you're calling wants you to call them. It's a mutually beneficial business opportunity for them, right? You're going to make them money. You're going to improve their cash flow. They want this. They want you to call them. Like it's not like they're doing you a favor. You can't go into it with that sort of mindset. There's no doing favors. It's not one person's advantage over the other. It's literally you're going to make money. They're going to make money. It's a no-brainer. And that's the conversation you're really having with them. There's no risk in it for them. The worst thing that's going to happen for them really is that you're not going to sell anything. That doesn't cost them anything. They don't lose anything. Um, so it's, it's, for me, I always go into those conversations with the mindset that it's a win-win. Like for these guys, it's a total no brainer to work with me. Um, and I take a lot of confidence from that when I go into those calls. When you said it, it's just another spot for you to get tripped up, right? Like you're going to get some no's. Um, in fact, that's one of their tricks to weed out. Uh, the fly by night guys, they'll answer the phone. I'll say, Hey, I'm wondering who I can speak to about becoming a dealer for your products. And they'll 
instant reply. Yeah, we're not taking on new dealers right now. But uh, Marty over here uh, is the guy you're going to want to talk to, right? And like they're they're just trying to like weed out people who aren't serious, who aren't going to actually do the work here. And so um, it is it is another opportunity to get slowed up. I know. Look, you know, telling my own story when I got held up in the beginning, I I got scared to call suppliers, even though I had a telemarketing background. I uh, ended up buying the 3d printer guy from someone who was sick because he had four suppliers on board and that was my my escape i didn't have to call he already had four right and the the big one the one that mattered dropped me immediately uh when i bought the business and so i had to call and i sat for two weeks i'm heavily air quoting here perfecting the website because i wasn't quite ready to call yet and it was all just bs man it was my way of avoiding what i needed to do and when i finally did um you know, and results may vary. Uh, I landed 20 out of 20 just by calling, just by getting out of my own way and doing that. And so, um, a lot, a lot of places for you to quit. Yeah. And like I say, it, it's confronting. This is, this is where the self-talk comes in where you start telling yourself stories. Oh, maybe I'm not good enough to get these guys. Um, you know, maybe, you know, what if they say no, you know, this is all going to be a wasted amount of time. Um, and you've just got to move yourself through that. Like it's kind of what there's, there's always going to be these times in when you throughout your business journey, when you're, you're going to have confronting things you have to do. So you, you have to learn to get comfortable with it, right? Because literally, you know, if, if you can't manage there's going to be a lot of things that are going to be a real struggle for you. And that doesn't mean you ever, ever have to not be nervous about it or not, not have feel, feel that, but, um, you just have to be comfortable with making yourself push through that and just doing it anyway. Um, and, you know, I think that's one of the things that is common common things amongst all people who are successful with this, even when they face something that they are uncomfortable with or they're nervous about, they find a way through. They solve the problem, they they do the thing or, or they find a solution to make it happen. Um, and so, like I said, some people are going to say no. So, that's normal. Like you're not going to get every supplier that's on your list and that's not a problem. All you need really is enough to get started because you're going to stay in touch with the ones that say no. And you're going to keep contacting them every so often because, you know, oftentimes as Ben said, they just put up a barrier initially to weed people out. But in three months time, they might say yes, when you started making sales and you're more established. So some of the, in my first store, some of the best brands that I've worked with, I didn't get approved till 12 months after I launched. You know, I got enough in the beginning that I had a a good selection, a decent selection of products for customers and I had some things I could market, but I kept calling and calling and calling and hitting the same people up like three or four times. And on the third or fourth time, they're like, you know what, actually, yeah, you you look like you're doing something now. Let's start working together. And, uh, you know, so for, for that first business, I mean, it grew better in the second year because I got, a bunch of brands on later that actually drove a lot of sales for me. Um, and so, yeah, you're just looking in the beginning, you want to just get enough brands so that you on board so that you can get started. And, and once you hit that mark, um, you know, you're ready to go. You, you're going to upload their, they're going to give you product data. They're going to give you product images, you know, price lists, technical specifications, all that sort of stuff, or they'll have a website that you can pull it off. I was going to you know, say, you, you hope in. you hope they give you something. A lot of times it's just like, yeah, yeah you yeah. can sell for us. Here's the price list. Have a great day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the yeah, way yeah. to the other end of the spectrum of we need your EIN. We need your sales and use thing. We need, we, you know, and they're going to send you this long CSV and just like, uh, you know, they're all over the place. You never know what you're going to get from a manufacturer. Now, look, sure. I mean, in, in the last six months, my team has probably got about 100 supplier approvals through. Um, and yeah, there's a mix of what you get from them. Um, you know, these days, most of them will ask you to fill out an account form, provide your business details, like about your, your, your company, your name, yeah, your EIN. That's, that's pretty, that's pretty much the common thing now. Um, so be prepared to do that, which is easy. It's not yeah, it's super, super simple. Uh, another rate, you know, easy way to get tripped up, but it, it's very, very simple. It's all free. And then you're going to get their product data one way or another. It really doesn't matter. And you're going to just start uploading that data into your Shopify account. So it appears on the front end of your website for customers to buy. And once you that um, in the right way, and once again, I mean, in my program, we walk you through how to do that. Uh, you're ready to launch. You're ready to start sending customers into that site. Um, and so that's kind of when you 
into the, the growth phase of your business. So we would generally start uh, the traffic thing by using Google ads. So we use Google ads, Google shopping ads, um, Bing ads, ads on the Bing network um, is kind of your first port of call because you can start getting that instant traffic coming in. You can start making sales. You can start learning about more about your customers, what they're looking for and all that sort of thing. So we start off with paid traffic, but right from the beginning, I mean, I recommend you start working on SEO as well, right? Search engine optimization. This is the biggest, if I was going to say anything's a secret about high ticket dropshipping that people don't know, it's actually that you're going to get your best results from organic traffic, not paid traffic. This is where I take, this is what I'm real big on at the moment. So the sooner you start working on that, beginning domain, it's not going to do a lot, but over time, it's going to start to snowball. And at some point, you're going to get more traffic from that source than any other, right, if you do it right. So but we start with Google Ads. And from that point on, then you kick into the whole whole marketing phase. And I guess this is, this is, this is one of the big differences with my program to others is that we have the complete game plan for traffic that anybody would ever need for a high-ticket dropshipping business. You will never need any to learn anything else. Other high-ticket dropshipping courses out there don't touch this stuff at all. It's kind of like, oh, you launched your business. Now you're on your own. See ya. And here's the most complex video you've ever seen on how to run Google ads. Uh, good yeah. luck setting yeah. it up using And it was recorded and, oh four years ago <laughs> or whatever. Very, very confusing. Uh, I want to, I want to iterate your SEO point there. Uh, so like, yeah, go for it. That's, I fell in love. Uh, and so some might know the name Corey, uh, Corey introduce me to it and man i just fell in love man i love seo uh paid ads are great but they're always the price is always going to go up right and so you have to find a way to attract customers and so i got really big into seo into referral marketing into email marketing yeah, um, yeah, yeah. there's there's Everyone. a lot to learn here yeah, right so i don't want to so i don't want to push you away but like um time's going to pass anyway so you might as well start learning some of this stuff uh i, I do like to get seo set up on the front end that's that's what i've been teaching yeah. most in my consulting uh i like to get it started as early as possible so it can yeah. get going and uh man i love seo i could i could jam on seo all day long especially like this is where we would fight over like wordpress is better than shopify i think some people would say wordpress is better for seo man i've gotten good at shopify seo i just i love it man i love it so d- please don't sleep on seo no, no, don't sleep on SEO. Like paid ads are great for high ticket dropshipping, but the reality is you're dropshipping. So you don't have an eight, like a 70 or 60% profit margin to play with. So like there's a limit for in any market as to how much affordable paid traffic there is. And you're going to hit that. At, and this, I see this happening. This is where people come to me all the time. They're like, oh, I'm running paid ads, but I can't get any more traffic because I, I start losing money if I do. I don't know what to do next. And it's like, dude, you've only scratched the surface on the marketing thing. Like, you know, there's so many other things out there than just paid traffic for an e-commerce business. And so, yeah, SEO pro- is the primary one, but there's even past this, yeah, there's a bunch of other stuff, as you mentioned, affiliate marketing. Like there's so many different things you can do. Yeah, getting your ads on Ask Jeeves is something that changed my life. I it's just if you aren't on <laughs> Ask Jeeves right now, you're missing out on serious traffic. Yeah, yeah. So anyway. Um, but yeah, so yeah, that's that's from that point on, you launch and then it's just kind of a steady progress process of improving your marketing. And this is one of the things I love about high ticket dropshipping is that at the heart of these businesses, they're a marketing business and a customer service business, right? This is actually the business you're running. Right? I tell people, you're not really a retailer. That's not how I think of myself. I'm a marketer and I'm somebody who provides a customer experience. Right. So if you get good at marketing or you work with people who are good at marketing or whatever it is, then that's once you launch the high-ticket dropshipping business, that's the, that's the secret to success, I think. Uh, it's not a secret, but literally, that's, that's the thing. And as you grow a high-ticket dropshipping business, you kind of start to become like an expert in, high, in in marketing, right? In online marketing, like to the point where I mean, I you know, over time I've had people pay me to do the marketing for them, right? So this just becoming familiar with the marketing and running one of these businesses opened up other business opportunities for me where other people are paying me to do their stuff and hiring me to do this stuff for them, which I think was really cool. And not just for high ticket dropships. I mean, I've done it for pharmaceutical companies, um, cosmetic companies, you know, that aren't even drop shipping because the skills, the skills are transferable. Like you learn SEO, you know, SEO, you learn Google ads, you know, Google ads, right? I think that's the coolest part of this model is that you're almost getting paid to learn. So 
as we said in the beginning, you can get started for a few hundred bucks. I meant that, right? Yep. Shopify is yeah. 20, $29 a month. Eventually, you'll go up to like the $79 a month plan. You might have some apps that get you to a couple hundred. But in the beginning, it's 29 bucks. Um, you're going to need a phone number. You can do that for free. I would definitely recommend Grasshopper. It's, again, like $40 a month. You can have your own 800 number that just comes to your cell phone. Um, there's not really anything else beyond that. And as soon as you set up your G Suite account, which is you know $10 a month uh, so that you have – you know, info or your name at that domain.com. Google's going to say, Hey, how would you like it? If I gave you $150 to come advertise on my platform, uh, they want you to right? Bing will do the same thing. And so you should, uh, be able to get your first sale on free money. Right. And so at that point you've paid yourself back. Hopefully you sold something that paid yourself back for Shopify and for grasshopper. Uh, also maybe put a few bucks in your pocket so that you can advertise a little bit more. Um, and then at that point, you're you're kind of rolling on free money, right? And maybe you'll have a month where you lost a couple hundred bucks. And the next month, you might make a few hundred bucks. I think my first month, I, I made a, a couple hundred bucks. The next month, I lost like $92 or something like that. Uh, the next month, I made like $500. Uh, but all along, I'm learning, right? Uh, like where else are you going to get an education that you can start for dirt cheap? You can ride someone else's brand equity and learn marketing, Um I don't know. I love this business model for so, so many reasons. And uh, it's, you know, again, half the reason... I've thought about teaching this for so long. I'm just, I'm really glad you are. There, there's nobody else I would have put it. I would have put in this position to start teaching it. And here's where it gets better, right? As well. Like aside from all that, which is all totally true. Like you're learning for free. It's, it's fantastic. And it's all, you learn so many transferable skills that if, if, if you didn't stick with this over time, go out and get a job with a marketing agency. They'll pay you to do all this stuff for them, right? whatever. Um, but you know, there's a lot of people out there, you know, the D2C guys who bash dropshipping, they're like, oh, dropshipping shit, blah, blah, blah. You know, what we do is way better. And it's like, well, the, the great thing about dropshipping is that after you've been doing it for a while, right, you've got a customer list, you know a lot about your market, you know what your customers want, what do you think? You can then go and make your own product and sell it to them. So you can you can build a business, starting a brand, you've got a brand. You can then start sticking it on your own products that you get manufactured, private labeled, whatever, start selling them at a much higher margin. And the beauty is you already know what your market wants because you've been dealing with them for a while, right? And so it's a great way to eventually get into producing your own products rather than doing that from scratch in a market that you've kind of researched, but you've never been in before. You don't really know about and you're just taking a bit of a potluck with investing a bunch of money into getting stock and everything when you don't even know if you're going to sell it, right? So I, I, that's what I love about it too. And I know you've been down that path uh, in some of the businesses you've been involved with. I did it. I even did that a bit on my first business, um, you know? So that's that's the beauty is that you start with dropshipping, but that doesn't mean you have to be dropshipping forever. You're going to have opportunities to start putting your own brand on stuff, right? And start having your own product lines. Yeah, I think there's actually a few opportunities here. Uh, I, I sat and thought about it. you and I discussed this. You asked me to come in. You know, could you come in and create like the private label section of this? As it's something I've done, and so I actually sat and thought about this a little bit. And uh, so, number one, you like once you let's use e-bikes for example. Um, once you've you know you're dominating the organic traffic for for e-bikes uh, and the paid traffic, you're going to get a lot of feedback, right? You're going to get a lot a lot of people telling you, man, I wish there was an e-bike that did X, Y, and Z, right? And you can go create that and create your own brand and have much better margins and you've already built a traffic machine to start your own private label brand so that's option number one option number two uh if you went back and listened to i want to say it's episode number two uh with brian angel uh also there's a whole nother episode with brian angel on here number 27 um we acquired a brand we were selling a brand and one of them decided uh their ceo decided let's go in a different direction and so we went and acquired that brand that we were carrying of standing desks and now brian you know spoiler alert if you want to go listen to those episodes brian went and acquired a treadmill desk company um put it under the same uh brand name and so you know acquiring my if if you just beginning acquiring might sound crazy, but trust me, it's not that hard. You can make a deal in many different fashions. And so we acquired a brand that way, right? So rather than go manufacture and find all that stuff, it was done for us. We just went and acquired it. Uh, the third option that I'm thinking of is I've got a friend named Blair who has a giant, giant uh, deck business. Uh, in his own words, we sell deck shit. Um, he is huge. He is the biggest drop shipper I know of besides Wayfair. Um, I'm sure there's, you know, maybe some other big companies, but he's humongous. And I think you have a real opportunity when you get bigger. Uh, and even before you get to his size to be a media company, if he wanted to be 
the deck shit guy on as a media facing company, I think he could. And there's many, many opportunities for you to monetize a media company, whether that's, uh, you know, newsletters are the hot new thing nowadays. Um, but there's also, you know, you could create all the YouTube videos in the world on how to use the deck shit that he sells. Um, I think there's a real opportunity to become a media company on the back end of this as well. And again, yeah, you're, yeah. you're learning all of these things. Essentially, you're you're kind of on a free roll here um, to learn. And and I don't know. I I love this business model because there's just so many branches that you can you can take off. And and, and to that point of what you said of like learning one of these skills and going somewhere. Um, I'm never taking a fucking job again in my life. There's no chance no, unless no. it's the coolest job ever. Yeah, However, yeah. I have been offered a job. I've been offered uh, 150K to 250K different jobs for different companies since I've been um, doing this thing, um, all because of the skills that I've learned along the way. And, you know, I do consulting and I charge a pretty penny. I charge $3,500 a month uh, to have a few calls with you and have you in my Slack channel. I couldn't do that if I didn't learn these skills and cut my teeth on, uh, on the dropshipping stores in the beginning. Yeah, yeah, totally. I, I got I got pitched on going and working for one of the biggest uh, outdoor brands in, in the country that sells products for, you know, four wheel drivers and things like that to run their Google ads. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, actually. You know, just just some guy I met. And he was like, "Oh wow, you got a great story. You've done some great things. Like, can I pay you to come and work for me? Like in a job?" And I was like, "Wow." I appreciate it, but yeah, no, I don't want a job. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but yeah, I mean that that stuff can happen. Like there's there's so many opportunities here, um, and yeah, it's just such a great way to, uh, you know, get into business with low personal risk, low financial risk, um, and learn some life changing stuff and impl- do some life changing stuff. You know, even if your goal as a, as a person is just to get you know, you're, you're in a career. And I think back to your story, Ben, you know, driving a forklift, earning 40 K a year or whatever it was like, even if you're just somebody who's like, man, I just have to make a change and get out of this. This business model is probably, I think one of the quickest and low risk ways you can do that. I can't, I can't think of it. I can't think of many better ones out there um, that you can sort of get, get back in control of your time, of your life and start moving in the direction that you would like to move in. And even if you don't want to do that, uh, this is a fantastic side hustle business because oh, yeah, you're selling yeah. you're selling high ticket stuff, and so you um, you don't get a lot of phone calls. Honestly, when you do, no, that's not, a, not that's compared a, that's to a, other businesses. That's yeah. a killer lead that you should close immediately. If you get good on phone sales, you're gonna absolutely be a rock star here. But I remember one business I had, um, uh, Pellegrill business, where I would get three phone calls a month. I would, I would close two out of three. Um, and, and when you're selling a $5,000, so the 3d printers, my best selling 3d printer was five grand and I had 30% margins. That's $1,500 per sale. Take some ads out of there. And if I sold just two of those a month, I'm probably going to put a couple grand in my pocket, uh, at the end of the month. Right. And that's, that's, yep. that's a great yeah, yeah. side hustle for three phone calls. I answered and tweaking some ads. Right. And so, um, I love this as, as just a business you have on the side, even if it's just your hobby, you're going to make, hopefully, uh, if you do the work, you're going to make some money. Oh, dude. Yeah. And I've had, I've had students and clients who do just that. They've got a day job that a career that they actually absolutely love. Right. And they don't want to leave it. Um, and then you know, 20 K a month from their high ticket dropshipping business while they're still working their job, they're earning more from their, their business than they're actually getting from their job. They're just doing their job for the love of it. Right. Um, yeah, totally. You could totally do that. You know, it's, you, I mean, you know, these businesses, if you're committed to it, like, you know, you, it can, it can provide so many things for you depending on where you want to go for your, with your life. You know what I mean? So I know we're, we're, we're almost out of time here, but I want to, it can't all be roses, right? This can't be the greatest no. thing since sliced bread and everyone's going to make it. Um, so a couple, few points. Number one, uh, I can't do the work for you. So, uh, you have to do the goddamn work and, and yeah, like John's going to be here to support you, I would imagine. And he's going to do some coaching calls and all those things, but this is on you. This isn't on John. Uh, the values in the course, I promise you. And, uh, soon to be on dropshippodcast.com. If you're interested, it sounds like you could hear us arguing over there in the near future. Yeah, yeah. Um, all the work is there, but there, you know, there, look, everything has some downsides. And so I took a few notes before this call. I'd love to like actually just p- touch on a few of these before we hop off. Um, damaged items is number one on my list. Um, you are the middleman in a drop shipping business. So Walmart, again, think of uh, think 
think of a Sony stereo at Walmart. If it's damaged, you could bring it back to Walmart. Oftentimes, you'll see on the box, please don't bring this back to your retailer. Please give us a call. Um, when you're drop shipping, if you're freight, you might have some damaged items. You are the middleman. And so oftentimes, you... Um, like I had a ping pong table show up to my 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 place this week. Um, if it was damaged, uh, the seller who sold it to me, I would call them, who would have to call the supplier to arrange the shipment to come back. Right? Um, it's it's not going back to you, the seller, right? And so, damaged items is something that sucks in this business because you are essentially the middleman between the customer and the brand. Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. Look, there's definitely downsides. I mean. You know, and sometimes those scenarios can cost you money, right? Uh, and you know, when I when we we you know, I said a lot. You know, this is a it's it's a low investment business opportunity and all of that, and low risk. That doesn't mean there's no risk, right? I say that in comparison to a lot of other business models out there, um, there still is risk, and there's still a lot of hard work required here. So this is not the sort of thing you're going to flip the switch on, and it's it's going to be all sunshine and roses from day one and you're going to be quitting your job in two weeks sort of thing right like there's hard work you hard make it right like yeah i give you all the steps you need to take and i'll give you all the support in the world you could ever need in our program but you still got to go that's not going to make it automatically happen for you You've still got to go out and implement all of those things you still got to go out and do it consistently and this is where you know i see people who say they fail at it um, the reality is they just didn't put the effort in. They quit. They got a month in, didn't meet whatever their often unrealistic expectations were, and they just quit. Their business didn't fail. They just quit, <laughs> right? Um, they weren't willing to push through, you know, try different things and, and and do the things they needed to do to make it work. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's the thing. You know, I mean, other like, you know, it, other things that might might uh, that that are not so rosy is you know you, you can have supplies that are not great to work with um, that can create your headaches right because there's things in this you can't predict when you're sitting the, setting the business up so you can't predict what a supplier is going to be like to work with on the fulfillment side when you're just having that initial conversation with them and sometimes you'll get suppliers who you place an order with them and they stuff around for a week they don't ship the product quickly even though they tell you they will and you've got the customer on the other side of you who's kind of getting a bit cranky because they haven't got their thing yet in the time frame you said they'd have it in. And so, you know, there can often be, you know, difficult phone calls with customers and suppliers and things like that. Um, but, I mean, I think that's true in any business, right, where you're dealing with customers, right? You're going to have unhappy people. Um, you know, you're going to have people who have unrealis unrealistic expectations of what you're going to do for them as well. Even though you've been straight with them and they're getting things on time, they're still be like, oh, no, it's not good enough, right? So That's funny. That's literally on my list, customer service. Yeah, customer people service. Are, now, people are assholes, man. Yeah, yeah. People can be assholes. And, and, and you're going to bear the brunt of that sometimes. And, and that's one of the things you're just going to have to deal with, the, one of the confronting things that you need to deal with. Now, the great thing about this business model is, is that you can bring a team on uh, to help you with customer service at a pretty affordable price, right? You know, I mean, you can get somebody to answer the phones for you for a hundred bucks a week, right? Um, and sort of be that first point of contact for your business. So you don't have to be. Uh, so there, there are so, there are ways you can manage all of these things if you're willing to. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I said, it's a marketing and a customer service business. So customer service is one of the, you know, one of the things that you control in this business. And it's also one of the ways you can differentiate yourself to your competition um, but yeah, it can have some prickly moments in there. Some days you're going to lose money on ads, right? You're going to run ads. You're not going to make any sales and you're gonna be like, wow, I just lost some money. And if you take a short term view of it, then yeah, you did lose some money, but you know, you're going to have days like that. Like I had months where I lost money, not a lot of money. I'm not talking, you're going to lose hundreds of thousands of dollars in this business model, but you, you know, you're going to have months where you might lose a thousand bucks or something. You don't get, get a return on that. You know, and that might be uncomfortable sometimes, um, you know, but you just got to stick through those things because that if you keep at it and you stay consistent, you keep doing the right things, those turn around. They always do. The other one on my list that that, that sucks, um, I'm sorry for rushing, I know we're up against it, is, is fraud. Um, and there's some companies out there that, you know, ClearSale and others that can get you in front of that, that will help you. They'll try to 
help you get in front of the, the fraud and reimburse you if fraud happens, but it does happen. Uh, there's also people who will claim chargebacks on their card because they're just unhappy with the order. Like really, I mean, the, the the people side of this, the customer service, there can be some real Karens out there. Uh, and I'm not sure what the male version of Karen is, but they can be some male Karens out there too. Uh, and so that, that those are some of the downsides there. And um, look, I, I actually have like a zillion more notes here and I know John needs to run. I actually need to run too. Um, I'm kind of leaning towards this dropship podcast idea, John. I think uh, there's like a million stories I could tell. I, I've got a full list of huge wins I had. I've also got a, a big list of things that sucked, and and I'm happy to like go through businesses. I've I've had multiple exits, and I could show you examples and like fortuitous fortuitous events that happened just by me doing the work. And I think uh, you and I could argue about literally like all the details, man. Um, oh yeah. And if people want to hear John and I argue, reach out. Like, let me know if this is something that would interest you because I'm totally okay hopping it, John and I are already hop on a call once a week. Uh, if we can hop on a call, throw it behind Patreon so you can listen to a podcast and you're willing to pay a couple bucks per show, uh, let us know. Please reach out to John. DM John. DM me. If you want to check out uh, John's course, which I would highly recommend through my filthy little affiliate link, check out dropshipwithjohn.com. J-O-N. Dropshipwithjohn.com. Um, I live and breathe this world. It's been fun. It's been an awesome journey. And all I've ever wanted to do is is help change people's lives. And so I'm so happy that even though I'm a little bitch and I didn't make this course that that you did, John, because like you're the right guy to do this. Uh, we talk every week, so we have very similar thinking on a lot of these subjects. And I know I know what you're teaching these people in this course is going to change lives. And so if I can be any part of that whatsoever, I'm happy to. Um, hopefully, you know, you've been asking me to make a couple pieces of this course. So maybe we'll end up being in this together in the end. And man, I'm just excited for you. I'm, I'm happy to support you in any way I can. Yeah, dude. And that's, that's one of the things we agree on, man. I mean... This for me is about primarily is about helping people experience those life-changing moments that you and that you and I experience. And this this is out of all the things I know how to do in life, this is the one thing I know how to do that can help people experience that. There are other ways to experience life-changing moments, but you know, I things that I've got the got the skills or the knowledge or capacity to teach, but this is my one thing. You know, there are other things I could teach people who are already rich to make more money, but that doesn't really light me up. It's like, you know, that person who's feeling stuck in their life, they want to make a change. And part of that is they need to change how they make their income, how they support themselves. This, this is one of the things that can do that. And uh, that's, that's why it's so exciting to me. And it's why I still do it, man. I mean, honestly, uh, yeah, I love high ticket dropshipping. What can I say? (laughs) <laughs> well check it out dropship with john uh and dm either one of us we're, we're available john warren on facebook you know you know how to find me uh, i'll put some links in the show notes to check all these things out or dm us if you want to hear more from us i there, i could talk for hours on this stuff so uh and i think john could too so reach out anytime otherwise uh appreciate you coming on buddy yep awesome thanks for having me here and thanks everyone for listening i am so happy john decided to do this uh, I'll probably be in there to help him in one way, shape, or form. I can promise that. Uh, I'm just excited for him and where he's going. And if you listen to this and this sounds like something you want to do, check out dropshipwithjohn.com, J-O-N, uh, and that'll head you over to his course where you can sign up. Uh, and we've had a few days since we recorded this, so John and I have had time to kick around that Dropship podcast uh, idea. I think we're going to move forward with it. I, I, we love to banter and argue, and you know, if you like this podcast, you're probably going to like that too. And so we wanted to set up a Patreon, uh, give us a reason to keep recording and and go a little deeper as well. Uh, So if you head to dropshippodcast.com or patreon.com slash dropshippodcast, you will see a sign-up link. We're going to charge five bucks an episode for this uh, and hopefully put out stuff weekly for you guys. Answer all the Q&As you could possibly have about this. And whether you're in John's course or not, it doesn't matter. Uh, This is for everybody. So as we mentioned, there's a couple copycats out there, including the course we took uh, way, way back in the day. If you're in that community, great. Sign up. If you want to hear John and I talk deeper about what we're doing, uh, I'm currently building a massive dropshipping store right now, and that would be a great place for me to kind of know who I'm talking to um, and be able to put stuff out there that maybe I don't want to put out quite in public just yet. So uh, I think we're going to do that. If you're interested, again, shoot me a DM, send me a message, or just go to dropshippodcast.com, uh, sign up for our Patreon, and That way we we know you're interested, right? Uh, Just go ahead and put your info in. And um, if we do move forward with this, as soon as we put out a show, you will be charged the the $5 and you'll immediately get access to our RSS feed. Um, I don't know. I'm excited either way. Uh, Whether you want to join us on a podcast, whether you want to join John's course, 
uh, or whether you just want to continue listening to the BK Show, I appreciate all of you for being here. I'm excited for John. I hope I get feedback from some of you that uh, you decided to hop in and, and start something of your own as well, because I think this is a great opportunity. So thanks, everyone, for listening. Next week, I will be back with Taylor Holiday, where we recorded a really awesome episode, if you ask me. Uh, Taylor was on episode number seven. If you want to go hear his story about Kalo Rings, Power Balance, uh, his friend and business partner puking in A-Rod's uh, kids' playground. Uh, just all kinds of amazing stories of, uh, of, of power balance, like having the World Series of Pucker champion wearing a power balance bracelet uh, or NFL players wearing Kalo rings. Uh, go listen to that episode. I think you're going to like it. episode number seven. It's one of my favorites of all time doing the show. And then, uh, again, he'll be back next week uh, to hopefully – challenge your, your way of thinking about a bunch of other things too uh, I, I really really had fun recording this this episode that'll be out next week so make sure you tune in and i will see all of you next wednesday <laughs>